So um, a very warm welcome to you, Jez. It's lovely to be sitting here with you. Um, we are normally watching you interviewing other people. And I thought it was time that we actually got to know the man behind. How many videos have you made? I think I'm up to 94 at the moment. Okay, so the man behind yeah. 94 and counting uh, videos that you've been making to help understand what on earth is going on on this roller coaster journey. Now, obviously, you've talked to probably more people around and the world about this than anyone else that I'm aware of personally and I'm sure that's probably true for most people um and which means that you know you are on the receiving end of a huge amount of opinion of thought of research of you know specialist kind of focus and I you know I love the fact that your brain has just been exposed to all of that on this journey and you are still in recovery yourself. So, you know, I want us to dig down into a little bit about who you are, what you've learned, what's been important to you uh, that you've picked up along the way and what what's next for Jez Medinger. So very firstly, I want you to tell us a little bit about who you were prior to all of this, prior to COVID, because you were not, as far as I'm aware, doing anything to do with health, were you? I was not, no. Uh, I was, I've, I've had a sort of a, an interesting career in the sense that I've sort of started, well, my career, if you say the career starts when you finish university, I, um, I did engineering economics and management at university. And as part of that degree, I, um, I did six months at IBM. Um, which was in my fourth year, and I wrote a dissertation that was part of it as part of my master's. But I came out of that six months just going, oh, my God. Like, I could not – it just drained my soul of all life. And there was something about just the relentless – I mean, it was only Monday to Friday, 9 till 5. So I had a yeah. relatively straightforward sort of uh, workload whilst I was there, but there was just something about the relentless nature of being a tiny cog in a massive machine where, yeah. and I just projected forwards. And I mean, they offered me a job and I was like, can I really imagine doing this? And I looked at the people who had got to the top of this particular organization in IBM and, you know, they were maybe in their mid forties and they'd absolutely busted a bollock for 20 years and given up all, all, made all sorts of sacrifices for it but to what end ultimately mm -hmm. to get yourself into a position where you can earn a bit more money and all of the changes that you might make all the things that you might do and with, they're in position a, a place of restructuring at the time so they were firing lots of people and I was trying to my uh, my dissertation was on about how their HR worked and about their organizational structure and the rest of it so I was connected into all of this there is a reason to for saying all of this and <laughs> and um and, and what do you what do those people achieve at the top they've spent 20 years doing all of this and at the end of the day they've changed one of the numbers on the annual report balance sheet from a four to a six in one of the columns that's it that's what they've done yeah. and I was just like I I just can't do this I, like there's there's what what is the purpose that drives these people and I don't get it and I could I couldn't get it and and that yeah. sort of I went out of that and I did a couple of seasons skiing which was much better for my soul um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um and then on the back of that I set up a film production company with a couple of friends and we started off making extreme sports films and then we sort of set up the company in London and we started doing all sorts of brands work, commercials, short films, music videos. Um, and I realized at that point in my life that I was passionate about filmmaking. And I've always loved films, but I didn't grow up in an environment where a career in media was ever an option. Like I didn't know anybody who'd done it. It didn't seem accessible or, you know. And I was like, oh, actually, I've always loved films. And I've always been fascinated by the idea of what it takes to make them. And this is movies kind of films. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the point at which we started the company up is like the goal was, okay, we're going to make feature films. And that's the end goal. So we made all this other stuff. And I finally got myself into a position after 10 years of production where I could make my first movie, um, which I did off my own back um, in terms of I sort of produced it. I did everything kind of. Um, and if you look at the credits on it, you'll find there's 
a lot of names in disguise, which are basically roles that I did <laughs> on the movie, or Robin, <laughs> who I who I also brought in on it, did a lot of it as well. We've got a lot of yeah, 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 names in disguise, but we didn't want to make the credits look like we did everything. Anyway, point being, we did, did that for a very low budget. It was about seventy thousand, um, which is extremely low budget for a movie. But really it did very well. well. Got released all over the world and critical reception. The rest of it, and it's still you know earning money now, almost ten years later. Um, mm. And I was really, that sort of was the point at which I really wanted my career from that point forward to be in movies. But yeah. it's a really difficult industry and it's an industry that's in flux and it's not a meritocracy um, or indeed a talentocracy, um, mm. like probably most industries actually, but particularly movies. And it's just as much as the work itself was nourishing when you could get to do it, that everything around that industry in terms of enabling you to step foot onto set was not nourishing. No. Um, and I was kind of in this point of teetering away. So this is early 2020. I was in Los Angeles. I was trying to sort of, I was, I was sort of making a last hurrah of thinking, okay, I'm going to throw some stuff at this over the next couple of years and see if I can get the second meal off the ground. And if not, I'll think about what else I should be doing myself. Yeah. And it was part of this last hurrah that I was in. Um, out in Los Angeles and literally came back to London six days later, caught COVID. But at that point in time, I was in theory, you know, I was training for my fourth marathon. I was very fit. I lived a life that didn't have any rest in it, really, to speak of. I was doing a lot of international travel. The work I was being paid to do was mostly international. So I was jetting around all over the world shooting client films, um, which was a great life. But I look back now and I think, yes, this was somebody who was in a, a chronic state of fight or flight. Um, mm. I didn't give myself any downtime. I didn't know how to give myself downtime. My downtime was going out and physiologically stressing myself as opposed to intellectually mm. stressing myself. And those are the two states I just bumped between. It was either intellectually, you know, stress or it was physical stress. So, and that was, I think, you know, the sort of the, the groundwork in a sense for the nervous system malfunction that was to come when I caught COVID. In Absolutely. March, yeah. And so many people will identify with that, probably not in as, as extreme a way as yours, but you know, I, I've spoken to so many people now who, for whom they look back and they reflect over the period of their life prior to perhaps the past five years, maybe even the past 10. And they go, I really wasn't looking after myself at all. It just wasn't on my radar. And I think also in a way like you perhaps have done, we equated being healthy, like being sporty, going to the gym with having a good immune system. But actually those two things are completely separate, you know, in many ways. I mean, they are linked, but they are not the same. So I think for many people, they thought I'm fit and healthy. I can run a marathon. I can lift weights. I'm not going to get so sick. It's fine. But actually, what we don't know is the impact of all of that chronic stress on the immune system. And then, therefore, how the body responds to something like this virus, which we have to remember, has killed many, many people around the world. This is no, this is no mean virus, right? This is a proper kick ass <laughs> problem that the world has been facing. So, so tell us then, at what point did you start you got symptoms at what point? Were you kind of before March? Were you quite early on? Or no, did you I know was, that it was COVID? So just to finish off a, a big part of that puzzle, just on the end of that last uh -huh. answer, there'd been, I'd also had the previous three years had been emotionally the most demanding of my life. Um, I My mother had passed away in early 2017. And <laughs> there was, I mean, they have, like, let's talk about having four pillars in your life. You know, you've got family, you've got relationships, you've got career, and you've got health. And suddenly all of these pillars started to collapse on me. And and there was a huge amount of stress in every dimension. And I basically had a kind of breakdown in there as well that led to a very severe depression. Um, and I was only just kind of climbing out of that when COVID came along. So it had also been a huge amount of autonomic emotional stress in there as well. So it really was the perfect kind of melting pot for a once in a lifetime once in a hundred year virus to come along and right. you know knock your socks off. Um, I couldn't have designed it much better, really. Um, so, where, so symptoms. I was March the 13th is when I first got my symptoms. And it was a bit of nausea first that just felt a bit off. 
And then the mm. next day I had the shivers, you know, and you know when you've got the shivers and you're like, oh, there's something viral going on here. And then an upset yeah. stomach. I did never had the whole cough, um, anosmia, any of that stuff. And actually yeah. I looked, one of the first studies I did, ultimately jumping ahead a bit, was actually looking at the symptom profiles of people who went on to develop long COVID and how many yeah. of them had the textbook three symptoms versus this other type of presentation, which was more of a, you know, nausea, chills, GI type presentation, headaches, yeah. Yeah. fatigue. That was actually more people had that than the cough and nausea. Yes. And, and, yeah. and that, that was, was my story too. Yeah. That was suggestive to me that part of the long long covid story would reside in the guts ultimately and mm. if you had a if you had an infection where the ace2 receptors got nailed in your gut as opposed to your respiratory tract maybe that would end up being more likely to lead to some kind of persistence or who knows what or dysbiosis yeah. anyway yeah yeah so so yeah so actually my acute having said all of that my acute infection was relatively mild compared to the other people who caught it at the same time because london just went bang everybody got it yeah. within a two week period yeah and um and the other, my other friends were feverish and they were sweating through the night and quite ill and to be looked after for a couple of days and I was doing a few hours work a day I was okay and I was like oh look because I'm marathon fit I'm smashing yeah, this right. virus's face off and um and then like in week two once your isolation is supposed to end I'm like okay I'm gonna go for a little jog I'm feeling rough but I'll go for a jog and I kept doing that and feeling awful afterwards and not really getting it yeah. um and then I guess it was, I kind of got a little bit better after sort of three or four weeks. And then at maybe five or six weeks is when I guess I got the one particular symptom. I've spoken about this before. It was a, a feeling in my throat and chest up here that I had never had at any other point in my life, apart from when I had glandular fever when I was 20. Right. And I was ill. I was wiped out for a year with that. Yeah. And because I had that particular symptom again, I went, oh, shit, this could be a long haul. This could be another year plus here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I can't be doing with that. But that's why I took it seriously. And that's why I started right. doing the research. That's why I started making the films, which was back in April 2020. Mm -hmm. And had I never had glandular fever when I was 21 or 2021, I wouldn't have thought anything of that symptom. And I'd have just been going along like everybody else thinking I'm going to be better next week I'm going to be better next week I'm going to be oh yeah. I'm not I'm not I'm yeah. not I'm not but actually yeah. I gave me a sort of a bit of a window into the future having felt that and that was sort of what fired me off in the trajectory that I've been going 94 films later right <laughs> <laughs> and a book. later right so that piece about everything that was going on for you beforehand I think is really it's so crucial I think for people to start to look at their lives as a whole and not just focus on where they are around their symptom experience currently and to look at how much or how little they've been conscious of the amount of stress that they've been running with and I think stress is a funny thing because a lot of people don't feel stressed but they are pushing themselves quite hard and it's about understanding that stress comes in many different formats doesn't it but you know you clearly experienced a whole gamut of all the stresses out there that you could possibly expose yourself to, you know, not surprisingly, it leads to a depression and not surprisingly, you know, you're on the back foot when exactly this pandemic kicks into gear and, oh, look, here's the perfect host. <laughs> yeah. But interesting, that glandular fever piece as well, uh, just, you know, anecdotally, that was my story too, mm. back when I was 18. Um, but uh, you know, no one really talked about CFS or chronic fatigue syndrome or anything like that back then. Um, and so it didn't even occur to me, it didn't even occur to me that I might have had chronic fatigue syndrome because I just pushed my way through it. I got it in, in the summer of my 18th birthday, went off to university and made myself do a performing arts degree, which involved, you know, dance classes every single day. And I would just limp in, do it, <laughs> kind of go back home and cough. For quite a long time at no point did anyone ever say you've probably got chronic fatigue syndrome just didn't wasn't a thing no one talked about it but also like I saw three four five doctors over the course of that year back in 2000 which is when I had it and right. all of them did blood tests they all came back normal and said you're fine you're fine you're fine I'm like I'm not fine I'm bloody wrecked I feel like I'm waking up after right. a 10 pint bender every morning yeah, yeah. um 
And it was only the fourth or fifth doctor who was like, ah, I think you probably got post viral fatigue syndrome. Uh, you will get better. It might take one year, three years or five years, but you'll probably get better. Men tend to get better more often than women. Yeah. Um, and he was the first guy, but it took five doctors. And even now, it maybe isn't that different. It ought to be better now, but it probably isn't from the amount of gaslighting that long haulers have had when they've gone to see yeah. their doctor, you know. Yeah, so. yeah. Interesting. So, yes, okay. But you knew, and that was that was the, the bit that just interested me. You you felt a sensation in your body, and you went, "Oh my goodness, I remember this." Okay, great. What I think <laughs> that probably was complete speculation. I think that was probably a bit of reactivated EBV that was actually because right. the EBV basically exists in this part. That's where it flares up. Um, oh, yeah. And given how no, how common we now know that reactivated latent viruses can be. I suspect right. that's what it was. So I, that's the reason why I felt that specific symptom is because it probably was actually the same thing. So I had a bit of EBV on top of long COVID for that month or so early mm. on in the long COVID journey. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And so instead of coming to total rest, <laughs> you went, I know, I'm going to start doing research and I'm going to make films. So what was, you know, why don't we talk about your drivers? Because obviously our drivers are quite big players in how we approach life how we look after ourselves so there was obviously a bit of you that was like I can't just rest I cannot just hand over my identity here I need to do something so tell me a bit about what was happening for you around that um I think it was all of us were in this sort of completely sort of rudderless yes position at that point in time where nobody could tell us anything literally nobody um, apart from the MECFS community, who were, who were already really early, like the MECFS society, like with it by like May of 2020, already had stuff up saying, guys, yeah. this is what you need to do. Yeah. Uh, and Charles Shepard at the MECFS society needs a lot of credit for that. Um, mm. And, but apart from those guys, and we didn't necessarily want to acknowledge at that time that maybe we ought to be following mm. these MECFS type. Uh, we were like, no, 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 no that's not. <laughs> yeah. that's no, no, that can't be us. No, no. That, that goes on for 20 years. We don't want that. No, that's um, horrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're all there. We've got all of these questions. We don't have the answers. And we feel completely out of control yeah. because the illness itself gaslights you. It's capricious nature where mm-hmm. it's you feel almost okay one minute and then completely screwed the next. Mm-hmm. And the ground the, you know, underneath your feet is perpetually moving. Um, let alone the reaction to people around you or healthcare professionals around you. But the illness itself is so destabilizing and it puts you in this um, fight or flight state, which in itself is also destabilizing because you're not grounded, right? Yeah. So against all of that backdrop, I have to feel, my, my nature is like I have to do something. I have to fight it in some way. So my way of trying to take control over this thing I had no control over was trying to um, answer some of the questions that I had and also the community by association had to. Yeah. And, and so I found myself, after the first couple, two or three films I made, I realized then that I had an audience very quickly who were very yeah. willing to, who had the same questions I did and wanted to try and find these answers too. And I realized I was in this unique position of being able to just data mine essentially and just try and quickly find answers to some of these questions. Like, are we all testing negative for antibodies? If so, why? You know, mm-hmm. what, 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 what do we look like demographically and pre existing conditions wise? You know, yeah. and all of these things, like, why, have we, why are we suffering when our brother is okay or my mate is okay mm-hmm. or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so for me, what ultimately, I guess my drivers were around wanting to take some take some kind of control back that had been rest rested from me. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally understand that. And I think, you know, it's interesting seeing those people that did step into a, a role of taking on a, a sense of, you know, I'm going to do something here, despite being ill, you know, I think of Claire Hasty and the Long COVID Support mm. Group and all of the other people that have been really big advocates that have kind of been born out of that. And, you know, all, all the other people that I, there's just too many to mention that stepped mm. into a role. Um, and I also felt, you know, I need to do something. I need to do something that will help me. So, you know, the bit that I took charge of was the bit that really made sense to me. I need to focus on this. And, I, and if anyone wants to come with me, then great. And so, you know, I, I remember really early on talking with my kind of group support sessions that we used to have, 
you know, about Jez's latest video. Who's doing the stack? Who's who's cutting up niacin? Oh, it's, you know, <laughs> we're with credit cards, cutting up niacin tablets. <laughs> What's our life yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rock and roll, long haul lifestyle. So yeah. rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and you know, it was wonderful that you were out there doing that, but I also had an awareness. You're also someone who is not well and you're, you're putting these films together and sometimes you'd look really ghostly. And, you know, I was thinking at some point, this isn't serving him. Mm. <laughs> He's serving us beautifully, but at some point we're going to know that this isn't serving him. Um, but you know, that has been part of your journey. And I think hopefully this the the knowledge that you have helped so many people at a time when there was nothing available has been something that's really kind of sat with you in a beautiful way but i want you to let's just go into some of the detail around the the sort of the evolution of the learning and the understanding from your perspective so early on you know there was there was lots of different random theories going around but what was the first big aha moment for you that made you go oh no this is interesting out MCAS. of all of your, MCAS. which one? MCAS. MCAS, yes. So your interview with P Tina Pierce? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because that was a huge part of my puzzle. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of other people, it was a huge part of their puzzle too. And yeah. um, it's, uh, for, I had horrific skin issues in the first sort of 18 months. Right. Um, so my skin was so inflamed and so painful that even just touching it would be like any movement I would do, even just sitting up, I'll be like, ah, you know, oh and, and you see yourself in the mirror, you know, when you get undressed and it's just crushing because there's something about your identity and when your whole body is physically falling apart and you can see it, I mean, even if you don't look at your face because your face looks like, you know, you died three weeks ago, you know, which it did <laughs> for a long time. Um, right. it, yeah, it, it's, um, yeah mental health wise all of that sort of stuff is crushing and 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 the mcas treatments and getting on top of that and realizing that diets you know all the things i was eating like early in 2020 i was i went through a phase of just getting loads of cherry tomatoes i just have them all the time because hey look it's free veg you know and it's really good for you but actually i was probably also just a slight degree of latent mcas that you didn't really notice before all of this suddenly becomes yeah. a massive thing so yeah yeah so suddenly changing diet and going on antihistamines was revelatory for me um, in terms of taking me from a place that was unbearable to bearable. Yeah. Um, I think the next sort of part of the puzzle that was a massive light bulb was just sort of the dysautonomia piece yeah. and understanding what was going on in terms of a sort of just managing things like identifying when you are when you've done too much because your heart rate sticks up too high and you've got to calm yourself down. And then the secondary part of that is actually the sort of the sympathetic, parasympathetic side of it and realizing that we're all stuck in, well, we're not all stuck in sympathetic all the time, but there is a preponderance towards leaning the wrong direction there. Um, and what sort of things can you do that are, you know, that help you get back to the parasympathetic? Um, and another part of it was probably the metabolic side of it as well. So that's the niacin side of things. Yeah. And I think I, I would say almost that there's perhaps, you know, people's particular symptom constellations are driven not exclusively by these three things, but these three things can play a large part. And everybody has their own different balance of them, right? Between sort of MCAS, dysautonomia, yeah. metabolic. Yeah. Some people yeah. respond incredibly well to niacin, you know, yeah. and they say they're back to 90% within two days. Um, yeah. they've got a very high metabolic side of it pathway that's out of whack and the others aren't maybe so high. And so they resolve that thing. Okay, great. Then they're, they're much better. Other people that may not be a factor at all. Yeah. Other people may be very potsy or dysphysmomic. Other people may be very MCASI. So yeah. I think an understanding here that everybody is a bit different and each of us individually have to try and work out what our right. arrangement is of these elements yeah. so that yeah. we can try and manage our symptoms accordingly and treat them accordingly. But again, mm. we're, they're still sticking plasters, fundamentally. All of this stuff right. is just sticking plasters. And I think exactly. th there was a realization, I guess, relatively early as well that, you know, because when you talk, I think maybe where you're going with your questions next, it's like having spoken to dozens of different specialists, all with, who come from their own fields with their own yep. views on what's causing this. If we picture like, the long COVID puzzle being this sort of 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. And we're sort of, we are filling bits in the whole time. 
Yeah. But what the specialists tend to do is they've got a particular corner of a jigsaw puzzle they've filled in, and it's all, let's say it's green. So they yeah. look at that piece of a jigsaw puzzle that's green, and then they extrapolate that to the whole jigsaw puzzle and go, the whole thing's green. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> but there's another guy in the other corner who's bits purple, and he's like, the whole thing's purple. And then yeah. another guy in this corner up here, it's, yeah. it's blue. And like, yeah, it's all blue. And I'm looking exactly. at all of it with all this green, purple, blue, and red and going, oh, I think it's a bit more complex <laughs> than that, guys. Um, and it's also different for everyone, right? So there is no singular 10,000 piece puzzle like on the cardboard box, you know, the, the picture no. that is no. ultimately, ultimately when we fill in that, that, that picture on the cardboard box, it's going to be different, slightly different. Yeah. Maybe okay. they're all going to be, take the metaphor further, they're all going to be like, I don't know, Viking ships or something, but they're all going to be yeah. different ships. Some of them will be like grounded, yeah. some of them may be in the sea, some of them will have sunk, you know, but they're all in different yeah. contexts. They're all in different states. And it's, you know, this is why it's so difficult. And this is why Western medicine is still floundering at the moment, yeah. trying to sort of put together this impossible jigsaw puzzle. And this, I think, is why the sort of work you do is so important, because what you do sort of transcends that, um, that kind of individual symptom slash sort of mechanism sort of obsession and just goes to a much a very different place that just enables the body to sort itself out. How can we help the body get to a place where it can sort itself out rather than forcibly trying to press buttons on the body to fix this, fix that, fix whatever, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> because all of the symptoms, you know, they exist, right? And the way that we treat people medically with Western medicine is we treat the symptoms, right? We don't often treat the, the cause. Well, why did you get that symptom? Why has your skin come out in those rashes? Why is my heart rate doing that? And we can kind of find out a lot of information uh, and, you know, go, right, well, let's give it that drug and let's put that topical cream on and let's, but, you know, as you say, sticking plasters. And my sense, you know, my understanding of my own body and my own health really from early on as a child was I really understood the link between being stressed and my health. Um, because I think I was quite a hypervigilant child. I think there was some stress in my own home. And so if I was if if my if my parents were stressed or there was tension there, I would probably get a sore throat or I would get tonsillitis or I'd get a chest infection. Because I was just hypervigilant to it all the time. And so my my nervous system was always just super sensitized. Later on in life, if I was having a conversation with someone that was very, very upsetting, I'd get severe earache, you know, I'd get headache. I knew my body was always talking to me. And so I never once treated the symptom per se, unless it needed antibiotics. I always, you know, as an adult have gone, okay, Susie, right, let's, let's take you out of this situation. Let's bring it down and, you know, learn to calm yourself, which is why, you know, when I discovered yoga in my late teens, it was the first moment in my life I went, oh my God, I feel good here. You know, this helps me because I had a very hypersensitive autonomic nervous system. And it was a light bulb moment for me in my life where I went, wow, that's powerful. And one of the things that I, you know, as an adult female, I'm 50, I discovered just for the first time in my life that I have ADHD, you know, and if you listen to the work of Gabor Mate, you know, his theory is that people with ADHD develop it as, as a sort of a response to perhaps stress in the home as a child. Uh, and that's obviously for discussion, but it really related to me. So that kind of, you know, super fast brain. So a bit like you, when, when I'm finding myself really sick in bed for many, many days, my brain is not quiet. My brain's going, what should I do? What should I do now? What should I do now? How am I going to help? I need to help myself. I'm going to help other people. And that constant internal dialogue was also, you know, really present for me. But at some point I needed to step back too. So I'm wondering if there's ever been a point in your journey where you've needed to step back from everything that you were doing because you went, actually, this is, it's not helping me. Now. Have you reached that point now? now. now. <laughs> so why? What's, what's happening? What's, what's brought you to this point now? plateau in terms of symptoms I think yeah. and and seeing that I'm not all of the things that I've done I've done them in a piecemeal fashion and when I say the things I mean 
the efforts I've made to get treatments or to get better or to whatever. And, and I have got better. You know, I am definitely better now than I was in the first six months. Yeah. But am I better than I was at month 10 or month 15? And now that I'm in month, I don't know, 30, maybe not. I mean, and I was actually, I did get myself to a place almost two years in where I was doing, where I genuinely felt like I was doing much better. And then I got Omicron and that sent me back to square one. Sure. Sure. And I, I, I think I've just, and I was kind of hoping, well, I'll get over this thing quickly. And maybe within three months, I'll get back to where I was beforehand. Actually, no, I'm now, I don't know, like, nine months that after that and I feel like I'm kind of at the same baseline level I was at for a large portion of the time before that and I'm just like I can't go on like this something needs to change you know um the book is now done there is less pressure I mean I've been putting a lot of films out recently um but I think there's less pressure on that stuff now I'm, I don't know that the work I'm doing is necessarily making any major breakthroughs I think a lot, a lot the baton has been handed over my role particularly I think in terms of that patient-led research was particularly important early when yeah. we didn't have the backup of the medical establishment but now we are starting to get research happening all over the place that baton has been handed over from the patients to the establishments mm-hmm. and you know I'm sort of covering what they're doing but I'm not really affecting what they're doing that's going to be happening whether I make these films or not yeah. and um yeah I, I i'm not prepared to spend the next three five ten years living a quality of life that is actually really quite poor i mean i might seem fine on this call that's because i'm having a good day i'm still going to need to go and lie down for probably an hour afterwards um two days ago i was basically wiped out i was on the sofa for six hours during the afternoon I couldn't even watch the football which is I love football and I couldn't even just deal with the people running around on the screen and the noise I was like ah you know and if you can't even watch a football game let alone do the list of a hundred things I'd love to be doing with my day really wanted to go out my motorbike really would have loved to go for a run really would have liked to drink a cup of tea really would have loved to have a glass of wine in the evening really would have loved to have a pizza or a curry can't do any of this Right. There's so much that's stripped and it's like you adjust to some degree to the things that you've taken out. But, you know, it it has an impact on your mental health at the end of the day and it needs to be resolved. And Mm -hmm. so this is the point in time when I've decided, actually, I'm going to and I'm probably not doing enough. Right. I'm taking a couple of months out, although there's the whole Christmas faff in the middle of it. Um, Really, I should probably take six months out, I think. and I think a huge part of this is environment as well, like shifting environments, like living well, in London it, in winter isn't you did, great. You did the um, video. So I show this to some of the people that come and do my fern program. Mm. You did the video where you went off skiing. Mm. And that was right. that was when I felt at my best. I, I think right. I caught Omicron on the flight home, unfortunately. So that sent me all, like the irony of it, right? You do the thing right. the together and then the Yay, consequence of that is that, yeah. Um, and yeah, and I, and I stick to that. And I'm when I'm a part of my going away is in January. I'm going to be out in a little, same little Swiss resort, and I'm going to do three weeks in autonomic conditioning. I got a lot right. of stick for that film, saying, "Oh, you're you know you're well enough to go skiing." And I think people's perceptions of what I was doing maybe weren't quite the same as the reality. Yeah. So you know, the hardest part of what I was doing was actually the three or four minute walk with my kit to the slopes. That I would get there, my heart, boom, 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 boom. boom. Yeah, yeah, but actually, yeah. whilst I'm there, I'm just sliding for 20 seconds, just standing there, stop, right. breathe, breathe yeah. for like 30 seconds, slide a bit more, 30 seconds, breathe, and then and then you're on a lift for 10 minutes. I'm just sitting there doing breathing exercises, calming everything down. Yeah. After yeah. an hour of that, I go home and I meditate and do breath work and sleep for the whole rest of the day. Right. Yeah. So it is like a very measured, paced bit of autonomic conditioning. And it really was autonomic conditioning because I, I checked my heart rate on the first lift I went up so I hadn't barely done any skiing at this point on the first day and it shot to like one four five and I was like bloody hell you know but by the end of that week it was just down at 90 doing something similar yeah. you know yeah. so there is a degree of that that you can do when you're able to tolerate it but of course all of these things are, are is your body in a state where the autonomic conditioning work you're doing is reasonable for the state you're in which is exactly what you do with your yoga right it's the same thing exactly that it's the same thing yeah 
And I think, you know, there's a really interesting piece about the fact that you could access that state somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So my goodness, time and time again, I have people saying to me, Susie, I went away on holiday. I managed to get away on holiday and I felt good. And then I came back and I felt ill again. It was like it was all I walked into the house and I put it back on like clothing. Um, and I think it's really we have to we have to look at the role of the brain. And we have to say, you know, actually, all of the things that are triggering the memory for your brain to know that you've been the most unwell you've ever been in your life. If you're walking back into that environment, there's something in there that makes you go, I'm not safe again. And bang, symptoms. Quick, lie down. Quick, it's too much. And it's an extraordinary thing and probably one of the most difficult things for people to come to terms with, you know, because they say, well, I just don't understand how that's possible. How can I go yeah. and be healthy, feel healthy, and then come home and feel genuinely very unwell again? I think it's a tough piece to, to wrangle with, but it is. When you start to dig around into that relationship between the brain and the immune system, you know, the brain is in charge of the immune system. And it's not like we're choosing to have symptoms when we come home because we come home with this complete joy in our hearts. Like, I feel great. You know, I had a great week in the sunshine. I feel lovely. I feel so much better. And then bang, wait a minute. My pots has come back. Hang on. I can't get out of bed again. You're not choosing that. But you have to understand the impact of the brain and and its role in this recovery, because your body's given you a clear sign. We can feel better. I think a lot of this, though, because I admit, I completely agree with you, the go away, feel better, come back, feel terrible, is also because pe when people come back, they come back to a set of stresses that they exactly. didn't have whilst they're away. And those exactly. set of stresses overload the system. And again, exactly. you go back into that same thing. If you could exactly. live exactly, the, do exactly the same stuff at home that you did on holiday, the difference would be much less marked, although there may still be environmental triggers, pollutants, and all the rest of it, yeah. especially if you live in a yeah. city, that can send the body into an immune activation state too yeah and a lot of people they come back and they've got the stress of work you know so if I'm better do I have to be thinking about work again you know and I, I speak to a lot of people who say you know as soon as I start to, to send an email about work I crashed <laughs> <laughs> but I can but I can send an email to a friend yeah. but if I send one about work then I'm really stressed about it and bang you know so understanding the importance of taking care of your nervous system your autonomic nervous system I think is so crucial to helping people recover and I know there's a lot of people out there sitting and waiting for the research. You know, give us the research and then there'll be a solution and then we'll be able to take something, apply something, breathe something in, have something done to our bodies that will fix us. And actually what I want the pandemic to teach us is that we really, really need to take charge of our own health and well-being much more. We need to teach our children about stress and its impact. We need to educate adults about you know, being healthy isn't just about being able to run. Being healthy is about managing stress in your lives and, and understanding that grief, loss, trauma has a massive impact. It's like they, they create little barbs that stick to your nervous system. And at some point, everything just implodes. It's like you can't, you know. And so your story is, is kind of the perfect example of that. Everything that had been going on prior for you was now played out in your in your ability to not recover. If you were to look at everything that you've learned about yourself over the past, you know, we're coming up to three years now, um, what is it that your big takeaway from this whole experience will be, do you think? There's going to be a number of them. I think... I think at a fundamental level, the things that you place value on changes so when you're healthy and you're living in that perpetual whirlwind of activity and the things that you think are important and the things that you think are valuable to you they change when you become ill and ill for a long time and sort of the things I was chasing the career I was chasing I which I spent 20 years chasing pretty much um I'm I think I'm at the point now where I could easily and gladly walk away from it without without feeling sadness with actually feeling that that's okay yeah. because actually that path wasn't going to be good for me you know and there are other paths that can be good for me I don't I guess I just always had this sense of 
I need to achieve something. I, yeah. I have to I have to make my existence mean something. <laughs> and that was sort of the path I was on to try and do that. And that's not because I want to be recognized. I want to be famous. I don't want any of that. I was behind the camera anyway. I just want to be able to create something that has meaning and of value in the world that means that that would then mean that I have a reason to exist. And, and again, I guess it's quite sort of deep in a weird way. Um, but I think that has changed a little bit now. And I'm just so grateful and thankful for the small things now. And I don't feel like I need to chase big achievements in the same way. I'm still driven, obviously. I've made 94 films. <laughs> I've written a book yeah. whilst being ill. But, um, Not many can say that, if I'm honest, Jess. Yeah, you know. yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think the way I look at my life and what's meaningful to me has changed. And I haven't quite figured out exactly what it is yet that is mm. going to be the source of my um, attention going forwards. And where my life goes from here I actually don't know because so much of it depends on health you know um it's it's very difficult to make plans when you don't know how you're going to feel tomorrow you know mm -hmm. um I would part of me I do miss the old job I did because there was a lot about my old job that was exciting and fun and creative and interesting and challenging and I do miss some of that and if I were to get better I would like to go back and do some of it, but yeah. just not try and go all the way down that rabbit hole to sort of the end of it. So I, I, I don't know how many of us who have been, you know, who are still maybe recovering from long COVID know exactly where they're going at this point of time. I think it's very hard to know, um, but I know it's probably not the same direction I was going in before. Yeah, right. And I'm definitely seeing people making a commitment to changing their lives because the amount of people that I've spoken to that say I can't go back because a lot of people say I want to get back to who I was before but actually you know under a little bit more interrogation they say my god no I don't want to go back to who I was before I want to create a much better version of myself one that is much more congruent to my own well-being mm. and able to pay attention to my health and well-being my, my heart health you know not just the physical muscle that is your heart but like my emotional health my mental health because actually without those two things being taken care of there isn't health you know you can't be super healthy and have major stress going on and anxiety and all of that it's all it's all part of the picture so i think a lot of people have learned much more about themselves than perhaps they bargain for at the beginning of the journey, right? It definitely challenges your identity. Uh, and you do have to look at it on that level. Uh, and I think I still see, and I'm sure you do, a lot of people that still sit there stuck up in the symptom level. I'm just going to stay here looking at my symptoms until someone gives me the answer. And I'm like, okay, there's just a whole other layer that I want you to inhabit if you can, where you can get to understand how to be around this and what it is that you need to learn about looking after yourself specifically so that this may never happen again you know or at least your chances are minimized but yeah it's you know it's a difficult journey for a lot of people and they don't want to do that they just want to get better quickly because society has created that in the past that's what happens well i think just there's i mean i talk about this a little bit in the book as well about how one of the primary challenges i think especially in the first 12 months but beyond that, too, is dealing with the the grief, essentially, of your right. old life. Of yourself. And, and what that kicks up generally is a huge amount of frustration and anger, yeah. bitterness, yeah. resentment. Yeah. And you have to find a way of processing and letting those feelings out in a healthy mm -hmm. way. Because if you bottle that up, I don't, your ability to calm the nervous system down is compromised right. <laughs> fundamentally. Totally. And, uh, but it's but there's so much of that stuff right that comes right you feel like you're letting it out but it's it's it, it's a, that I would almost say is one of the biggest challenges if not the biggest challenge to actually getting to a place of calm and acceptance and looking forwards as opposed to going back is actually getting to that place of acceptance which is so hard 
Yeah. And, and that doesn't mean that you will won't still have flashes or moments of feeling frustrated and angry, but it's that is one of the greatest challenges. And I'm sure that your work is probably you encounter this all the time, but maybe some of the people coming to you have already got past it. I don't know. Well, I think, you know, the more the more it's talked about as actually being a pretty solid with no, you know, negative side effects route, the more people go, okay, well, I'm, I'm willing to give it a go. And, you know, the people that come to me are perhaps people that would never have tried yoga before. And, and there's always, there's a comment that someone put in one of the, the Facebook groups quite a while ago, which, which I still kind of laugh about now. It's like, if someone else, if someone else mentions doing yoga to me, I'm just going to go completely crazy. You know, I'm so sick of it. And I was just like, I'm, I'm imagining that probably doing a little bit to calm your nervous system. would be really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> for god's sake you know stop mentioning yeah. breathing it's like well there's a little bit more to it you know we're not just giving you something to do whilst you're ill we're actually helping you work with your nervous system in a way that you may never ever have thought about doing before so i don't know how common this is in terms of feedback you get from our classes i've now done three or four of them and in every single one of them it has enabled for me, I haven't necessarily done all of the stuff exactly as you've been describing in the class, because what I've actually needed to get out of it was emotional release. Yeah. And I have found myself basically crying slash sobbing for 10, 20, 30 minutes in those. And there's a part of it, which is, and part of that is the acceptance of going, it's okay. Yeah. You are here now. Yeah. And, and just accepting my body as it is which there's always been this resistance to that because I've always sort of prided myself on being fit and athletic and able to do all of this stuff and actually being able to go it's you are sick now and that is okay yeah. even just admitting that as a sort of fundamental internal emotional level has just created this cathartic you know outpouring of emotion and after those classes I'm like oh yeah. It feels like someone's just, I've been, I've been living in this state like a wound up toy. Yeah. And, it, and it's just like that toy's just gone, brrr, you've lifted it off the ground, and my little feet have gone, brrr, <laughs> and then like, oh, and then there's oh. peace. Right. Oh, that's beautiful. So thank you. Feedback. Yeah, no, you are so welcome. And I think, you know, our, our whole focus, it's based around the polyvagal theory, right? Mm. You need to feel safe in your body it to heal and whilst we're stuck up on our head going symptom 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 what's the cure what medicine what should i you know we're not safe because we're reminding ourselves all the time that we're sick and we're not better and and actually coming home to your body actually inhabiting your body without being afraid of what you're finding there and it is literally about giving yourself a hug and saying it's okay it's going to be okay like right this will pass just come home and and be loving <laughs> for a bit be just it's okay and I really really believe that so many people would benefit from stepping into that place because it's a terrifying thing being in a body that you're afraid of um and that isn't doing what you want it to do but and you actually, can't trust you fundamentally can't trust it. exactly yeah you don't feel safe in your body and all of the work we do on the program is about saying you know what just come back in and inhabit this because it's okay, you know, you'll trust it. it. It does some weird stuff as part of the journey, but don't be afraid about any of it. And that's where working with, you know, Boone Lim and Melanie Danny have yeah. really helped back up my understanding, my belief, because they've come and gone, the physiology of everything that you're doing is so important to help regulate and the symptoms will change. And, you know, it's slow. It's not a, a tablet that you can take that's mm -hmm. gonna do it, but if you do the work every day, you'll get there and it's true you know for most people and anything else at the moment we still have some sort of stuff that we can work with you know there, there is you know if you've got inflammation with your heart you go you get that treated you know all of those bits are pieces of the puzzle but actually the work that everyone would benefit from doing is the coming home to themselves and just showing themselves a bit of love and shifting out of that fear and terrified kind of nature nature in their body but to come back to a place of going okay yeah as you say your feet just go oh i'm home again so i'm really pleased to hear you say that that's great the the other interesting um part of this i'm reading a book at the moment which is excellent uh called cured by yes. jeffrey rudiger 
Okay. Yes, every everyone has to read this book. I okay. tell it all the time. <laughs> yeah. And and it's interesting because I'm just at the section at the moment where it's talking about how the parasympathetic system is aided by the little moments of connection yes. that we have with people. And what's so interesting about what you've done with your classes is how you've created this inclusive sense of community. Exactly. And it's not just a sort of a unilateral, here I am talking at you, now you do the yoga. It's no. a bi-directional sense of community where you try and create this sense of inclusivity for everybody yeah. which I think feeds into this and makes people not just feel there's all sorts of like straightforward things that it does but beyond that I think it also serves the greater purpose of what you're trying to do and I think that's Absolutely. really important it's probably the most important piece of what we do actually you know I think so the big rest repair recover classes which are you know very well attended live as well as you know all the people that watch them on catch up Prior to me pressing record, I will have gone through and said hi to everyone, everyone. And if they've, you know, got out of bed for the first time, maybe in weeks, and they're in a different room, I'll be like, whoa, yeah, I took you out, Sarah, you moved, you know. People feel acknowledged, and it's joy. You're creating joy, and actually joy is one of those key emotional states in your body that's going to shift you into the parasympathetic state, right? Right? So everything that we've done is about how can we make this fun? How can we make this feeling like there's a community? How do we how do we connect people up? Oh, we've got three people in from Utrecht today. Hey, you guys, you should meet. It's just, it's so important. And it, you can't just get that from going and doing your breath work by yourself. I think it is important to show up with others as much as you can because you start to see familiar faces and then you feel like we're part of a family doing this. We're on a journey together and I'm not alone anymore. And I think that's really important for our mental health, right? Mm. Because being ill, as you've already described so beautifully, it's really hard work. So I'm, I'm really pleased you've, you've gone this big circle talking to all of these people and you've come back around and gone, okay, I'm going to give it a go now. <laughs> the funny thing is, I mean, I remember hearing about, your work instead of setting this up ages ago a year ago and I, was like, I need right. to do that but yeah. I just it's just I'm so, so happened I've only got around films. to it exactly yeah <laughs> I only just got around to it now perfect well now yeah. feels like the right time doesn't it I hope you take us away with you to the Alps and you get some time to look at the beautiful views and connect mm. with joy and I wish you all the best with coming back from your time away fully recovered I think it's totally possible wonderful thank you Susie Jez it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, I'm sure we will speak again. Yes, yes, no doubt. Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.